Hey, everybody. Welcome to Momletics. I'm your host, Rebecca Sheehan. Here at Momletics, we make politics palatable for parents. So often we talk about the mental health issues associated with too much technology use, especially the impact of social media. But how often do we consider how these devices might impact our physical health? Naturally, we assume they're safe since our cell phones and laptops are pretty much like extra appendages at this point. Plus, companies continue to sell them and major health organizations aren't really speaking out against them. But picture this, a pregnant woman from the 1960s or 70s sitting outside getting a tan with baby oil, no SPF, cigarette in one hand, martini in the other. Meanwhile, her husband is inside in the new baby's nursery rolling lead paint onto the walls. You get the picture. A few decades from now, will there be a new disturbing scenario, but this time with cell phones and a laptop? Joining us on Momletics to unpack this potential danger is Dan Debon, an internationally recognized expert on the radiation our handheld devices emit. He's also the founder and CEO of Defender Shield, a company that manufactures and sells device cases and other products to protect us from potentially harmful rays. Will his technology save lives, or is it something you're not too concerned about? Take a listen to our interview, and you be the judge. Dan Debon, thank you so much for joining us on Momletics today. Rebecca, thanks so much for inviting me. So I'd love to hear how you started Defender Shield. It seems like a pretty interesting story from what I've read. Well, about uh, 12 years ago or so, my my sons, adult men, were visiting on a holiday, and my wife noticed that the kids had their laptop on their lap for about three, four hours at a time. And she said, she wants grandchildren. And she didn't think it was a good idea to have laptops on your lap. And I sort of laughed it off a little bit because I was in the technology industry for quite a number of years. And I knew the emissions that were being generated uh, by the laptops and the power levels were relatively low. And I said to myself, there's no way those power levels can influence the male sperm. And that was what she was referring to, of course. And so I said that this is ridiculous. But at the same time, I actually thought about it a little bit and I'm thinking to myself, well, let me go look at some of the research on, on the subject of uh, RF, radio frequency signals that were coming from the laptop. And in this case, it was from the Wi-Fi. And I looked into it and I found after about three or four hours, even back then, we knew that 20% of the male sperm was immobilized, uh, ineffective, only within that short period of time. So the more I began looking into it, the more I realized that that problem maybe needs to be understood. And because of my technical background and actually Bell Labs in, in New Jersey and at at and I began uh, finding ways of shielding my boys' stuff, uh, their, their junk. I built them prototypes where they could actually put it in their lap and use it. And, and to my surprise, their friends liked what we did. And so we started a company when I never really intended to start a company. I, I had actually sort of retired. And uh, that's how we got started. It's amazing how companies start like that, just yeah. because you're passionate about something and then turns out lots of other people are too. Yeah. I read an article about uh, parents that bought their six-year-old child a cell phone when she started using it incessantly. And she was a very healthy young lady. And within a year, she had uh, passed away from frontal lobe cancer. And that really bothered me, like originally would happen with my wife and kids, and I said, the technology we created for the laptop is good for the cell phone. It blocks the signal from entering into the human body. And so that's how we began expanding Defender Shield to do more than simply just the laptop. So can you just back up and explain for everyone who isn't familiar what exactly electromagnetic field radiation is and how it impacts us? I worked for Bell Labs about 30 some years ago. During that time when I wanted to figure out something complicated and needed a computer. I went to a mainframe that was like 500 feet away from me. And I connected that mainframe through a monitor. Well, that mainframe emitted electromagnetic radiation, yet it was 500 feet away from me. Today, the same power of that mainframe 
is in my laptop computer. It's in my tablet. It's in my cell phone. So all of a sudden, all these electronics started coming around us very, very close. And we started using a lot of devices more than ever before. So almost any electronic device we have in our lives emits some form of electromagnetic radiation. It could be extremely low frequency, like in the case of your hairdryer and your toaster oven, your, your refrigerator. Do you think it's sort of a compounding factor that's so dangerous? I actually talk about it in the context of one bee can sting you and you'll probably survive. A thousand bees will kill you. And so the way I describe it is every one of the transmitters you have in your environment is a bee sting. And the more electronics you have in, in your space that's transmitting in your environment, that's more and more evidence that you're getting higher and higher exposures from emissions that could be pretty dangerous to you. And Is it so, the same type of emission, though, from different devices? Like, does your cell phone emit similar radiation as your laptop, for example? It's electromagnetic radiation on a spectrum. And so when you're using these devices, the cells of your body are responding to that as if it's a toxin, believe it or not. In fact, in uh, uh, WHO, World Health Organization, they talk about electromagnetic radiation, RF signals, as carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic. So aside from your cases, are there other things we can do to minimize exposure, like not putting your laptop on your lap or using earbuds instead of holding your cell phone to your ear? And the answer is yes. It's very easy to do. We talk about the number of bees in the room and a cell phone. You have a Wi-Fi signal, a Bluetooth signal, and you also have a cell phone signal. Three separate transmissions coming out of your cell phone. I personally only use my cell phone to make phone calls. I turn off the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. I turn off two thirds of the signals entering into that room. So some of the very first things you do is if you're not using it, turn them off. That starts helping reduce the exposure. But it's also interesting if you take a cell phone and put it to your head, that's probably where you're going to potentially find the worst damage to your frontal lobe. But if you move it four foot away from you or more, something like 98% of the potential dangers are gone. So the distance you are from the transmitting source is pretty important. And time. Right. If you call your, your mom and you spend five minutes on the phone call and you hang up, there is literally nothing to worry about. But if you're a heavy user and uses hours at a time during the day, you're three times more likely to get frontal lobe cancers. So distance and the time, those are in factors. And then turning stuff off really does help you in those precautionary measures to keep your, your body healthy. So let's talk a little bit about the data because, I mean, when you Google this, like I did, what pops up first is the FDA showing that it says, the data clearly demonstrate, this is from the FDA, no widespread rise in brain and other nervous system cancers in the last 30 years, despite the enormous increase in cell phone use during this period. So what data are you looking at that they're not? So as I mentioned to you, the WHO, World Health Organization, they consider an RF signal to be a 2B carcinogenic. It is potentially cancerous causing, just as if other toxins that are in that category, like arsenic is in that same category. So there is recognition worldwide by some. Let's talk about the FCC. They actually brought the FCC to court and said, the standards you have for the industry is not consistent with what we know from modern science. There's substantial accumulated data, even by the federal government itself, National Toxicology Program, what the federal government spent $30 million on several years ago had an epidemiology study they did, and they exposed their subjects to, to emissions, and they found that there was a statistically significant elevation of frontal lobe cancer and heart cancer, believe it or not. Everybody was sort of surprised about the heart, but it's soft tissue. That's why it was impacted. So there's abundance of studies that are now statistically significant. In other words, it wasn't a couple of people saying I got a problem. There were tens of thousands of subjects that were under pressure. So 
the more you have, the more statistically significant it is. And that data was ignored by the FCC and they lost in court. They were pushed back by the court and said, you need to look at the evidence. So are you saying that Verizon and T-Mobile and Apple paid a lot of money for them not to um, publicize these results? So there's a lot of money around. Remember, more than a trillion dollar industry that sort of allows them to position their, their positions in the marketplace. Every one of those that are leaders within TCIA were industry experts from the wireless companies, and they influenced the industry to say there's no problem. The other factions, which is the independent science uh, experts, that were, which are worldwide, they have a differing opinion, and they have uh, substantiated the claims of their studies pretty well over the last 10 years or so. And so there is a conflict in the marketplace. You have those who say there's no problem and you have the others that say there is. There's certainly very strong positions. Dr. Powell, for example, is a very well-known biochemist. He talks about when a woman takes a cell phone and puts it in her back pocket, he argues that the eggs of the cell of, uh, of this young woman can be mutated and there can be DNA damaged cells as a result of it. And those damages can evolve until she has children. And those DNA damaged or mutated cells become part of the child. And so some argue that it's as serious as that. Those dynamics are in the marketplace. You listen to both sides and you really need to decide how you want to deal with it in your family. How were a lot of these studies conducted? I mean, it's hard to actually establish causation and not correlation. Yeah, actually, and have any of them been longitudinal? Has there been enough time for that? Uh, Rebecca, absolutely, extremely good point. You know, we we wondered why does it take thirty years before we know and understand it's a problem. I like to give the example of why we would need to take thirty thousand children and we'd have to put them in one room, give them organic food, and see what happens in thirty years. We'd have to do the same thing, 30,000 kids, and put them in another room and radiate them for 30 years and then see what happens. In other words, most of these studies have 50 people in it, maybe 100 people in it. Nothing's really grand enough so we can conclusively say there's a causal link. And that's why it takes so long, because causal links are hard to prove. So COVID really eroded public trust in the government and the CDC. Have you seen that had an impact on your business? Like, is that distrust spilling into other areas of our health? Oh, yeah, no question about it. And in fact, for good reason, as I mentioned before, the FCC lost in court because they did not look at the current data. And the judge said, you need to do that. I don't suggest that the government is going to make sure that I'm protected or not. I know for a fact some of the data that may influence, they ignored. So I wouldn't trust the government in that sense to make those decisions for my family. And by the way, the argument about smoking, I smoked 35, 40 years ago, and there was no evidence at, at that time to the public that there was a link between lung cancer and smoking a cigarette. But do you know at that time, Rebecca, science knew it, but it wasn't well-known in the public. How long do you think it will take for these problems to sort of manifest themselves in a widespread uh, manner? Trans fats, which is now recently been banned a year or two ago in the U.S., was banned 10 years ago in the, internationally. And so trans fats took over 30 years. It took over 30 years with uh, smoking. It will take 30 years with cell phones. Because I guess from when you start smoking to, I mean, God forbid, when people get lung cancer, that's several decades worth of smoking yeah. that leads to that. Yeah. Well, I, I gave you a statistic a minute ago about if you're a heavy user, it takes 10 years before there's evidence of that impact use. And that's why you're three times more likely. But it takes over 10 years for you to achieve that. You may be a heavy user. It's not unusual that within five years, you have no idea you have a problem. Would you say there's one technology in particular that's the most dangerous 
I know you mentioned putting a cell phone directly to your head. Would you say that's it or something else? I think that's probably the most uh, dangerous. And, and let me tell you why, Rebecca. The standards were created over 30 years ago. They were designed using six foot males that were in the service. They looked at how the body would react to various power levels. And they generated a standard based on the six foot male. Well, it turns out it represents about 3% of the population. And the reason I said before that is probably the most concerning is because for a six-year-old child, that same signal goes right through their head, completely through their head. That's the biological impacts that are becoming obvious. The thermal means very little. And by the way, thermal means what does a microwave do? When you push the button, turn it on, it cooks the meat. It actually heats the water between the cells. The cells oscillate. And voila, you have a cooked piece of meat. A cell phone or, or Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz. The power levels are much less. It's the same signal. It's actually a microwave oven that's sitting on your closest to your head. That's so disturbing sounding. <laughs> but if you're aware of these kinds of things, it's really, you, you just use caution with technology and you really there's no real problems if you're familiar with maybe practices that help you minimize those exposures. A lot of what I see young kids do nowadays, because I have a five and a half year old and two four year olds, is the iPads. So it's less like talking on the phone with grandma, but it's FaceTime and playing these games on iPads. Right. How bad is that compared to cell well, phones? There, there, there are a couple of things about that. You know, what, when you ask me about what, a, what is electromagnetic radiation, I pointed to a bunch of electronic stuff. Well, now I'm going to talk about the visible light. When you look at a screen or a monitor or, or the monitor of a tablet, there are LEDs that are creating a spectrum of colors. Within those spectrum are what they refer to as blue light. Blue light is electromagnetic radiation. So... When you have a child using a tablet, there are two things going on that maybe you want to be careful about. You got to watch the time in the monitor because blue light's going directly into the eye of your child. In addition to that, you probably have it connected to a Wi-Fi. You have two potentially concerning things. With blue light, it's typically you worry about premature macular degeneration. The back of the eye gets impacted by use of that blue light in the eye and you, you tend not to blink and so you get tend to get dry eye so there's some really well known under, understood problems that you're beginning to have your children exposed to at a very very early age it's unnatural for sure yeah it is so looking toward the future are there any other areas you plan on delving into in terms of technology like yeah, electric actually, cars or anything else. You know, believe it or not, cars are pretty safe. These electric electric cars. ones with the yeah, big, they big are yeah. and battery I, and. <laughs> so what we when I mentioned your refrigerator as a source, it's actually not the refrigerator. It's the little motor that's winding around real fast, uh, compressing the air. It's the winding of the motor that's generating the emissions. It's true also when you have a car that's electric the windings that are generating those emissions are in the wheel hub. They're not in your cab of your car. And, and so it's far enough away. Distance is your friend. So believe it or not, they're fairly safe. What's more concerning is that the monitor you're looking at is they're much three, four, five times bigger than they used to be. And there's emissions coming from that, including blue light. Better back up then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, back up a little bit, right. <laughs> It is scary how much we use devices today. Kids, you got to be careful using this stuff uh, at a young age. Um, it does have an impact and your kids are going to use it, but you just be careful about how much they use it. So tell me more about Defender Shield. Is it a family effort? Are your, your kids involved? We began, all of us working together a bit on it. And as a family business, we started with devices that we bring closest to us that we build shielding products for. Um, we also 
as an example, for pregnant women, we have uh, straps that we, we build around the belly of the woman. We have blankets. So those kinds of stuff have expanded in the family business. And believe it or not, we actually began looking at ways of finding supplements uh, that actually can help the body be resilient. And so we started one place and we're way far away from where we started now. Wow. So what's the status of those supplements? 20% of us are electric hypersensitive. Of that, 80% are women. So we began looking at ways of trying to offset the problems that we know were existing in the environment. So we have a uh, probiotic, which is specifically designed for all things, but including electromagnetic radiation exposure. We have an eye product. Um, one of the things I went after was the eye problem because a, a lot of people are getting more dry eye, as I just said. And a lot of people have premature macular degeneration. There's a lot of impact to the eye. And by the way, the eye is the, the, the conduit to the brain. Are they the blue glasses? Yeah, that's why you wear blue glasses. Well, it turns out that you can find raw materials in the natural world that can shield blue light. So we actually have a in our supplement, a blue light filter, just like blue glasses, yet you're not wearing glasses. Hmm. So there are things we have that are related to the digital exposure, as well as we went and found the, the purest of omega, which helps inflammation better than most things. So we know that when the bodies are exposed to radio signals, the bodies, it needs to be resilient to that. And the best way to help is make sure that you have the resilience defending the cell itself, which omega-3 does. Seems like you're really attacking it on all sides, which is I, I'm, amazing. We're trying to do the best we can, right? What makes you so passionate about this? It seems like you're devoting so much of your life right now to this cause. Re Rebecca, I, I retired um, 20 years ago. <laughs> so you have time. Uh, I have a little bit of time, right? And and then, of course, I, I sort of understood this stuff pretty well. And so I had a chance to do something for myself and for others that I think is meaningful. So the more I got involved, the more passionate I became. Well, my son and I wrote uh, Radiation Nation, which is another book you may want to read. What we did was we showed you what the science is, what we understand. We showed you what the government thinks. We showed you ways of taking action on dealing with this. And we wrote it for people who weren't technically savvy necessarily that wanted to try to understand what the problems are. Do you see yourself sort of as a vigilante here, bringing the truth to the public where the government might not be? No, not at all. We live in a very dynamic environment. Some have the role of being zealots. Some have the role of being politicians. My role is fairly simple. Um, I just simply want to try to understand what the problems are because I have a sense about this stuff and I like to share it as a, a data point. I don't even like telling where people where my website is, because that's not why I'm talking with you. I'm trying to get people to have a sense of what they're hearing, and maybe they can draw their own conclusions. What would you say to someone that looks at the title of this podcast or the, the topic of it and says, oh, that's a ridiculous fringe idea or a conspiracy theory or something like that? Great question. I've read hundreds of articles by biochemists who understand and can explain the breakdown of the cell from an RF signal. So when they say there's no problem, they're not reading science. This is science that exists. You may argue that the, the study wasn't set up right. You may argue that their findings were wrong. And that may be a story you can argue, but you can't say there's nothing because there's a lot, but we just don't know it. And most of us don't understand it because it's in technical terms. But it exists and it, it does have an impact on the human. So wrapping up, are we missing anything? Is there anything that you wanted to cover no, I, that we didn't get to? One of the things I often say is uh, you're the architect of your own destiny. And we've been dancing around this a little bit. Uh, you can't rely on the federal government to make sure that you're going to be protected. You can't rely on your neighbor. You really need to think about how you want to lead your life in all these different ways. 
including exposures to RF signals. It's your responsibility and it's yours for not just you, but your family. If you want your children to be protected, you have to decide what those rules are. I know some families watch the time domain of using technology as one way of dealing with it. Others do nothing. This is choice of the families. So speaking of families, Dan, one last question going back to the beginning of our conversation. Did you ever get the grandchildren that your wife was so concerned about? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not at all. So I've protected them. They have definitely have sperm, but they're not have making babies. <laughs> they need to get on that, right? I under I have to tell you. <laughs> irony of all irony. All right, Dan. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I think it's definitely a provocative topic, and maybe we'll think twice before we pick up our cell phones and hold them up to our heads. I know you said you don't want to point people to your website, but I am going to right now because if you are interested in picking up a Defender Shield case or another product, you can get 10% off your purchase with code MOMLETIX. That's DefenderShield.com. And thanks to all of you for joining us on MOMLETIX today, where we make politics palatable for parents. We'll see you next time.